When I was a kid, my mom told me that everyone needs a reason to feel responsible, a duty. Now, I always thought that was a bit strange because for me, it seemed like your greatest responsibility would always be your perspective. But that didn't fly for my mom. She wanted me to have an actual, tangible, real responsibility. So I, I got to thinking, I was like, well, mom, what responsibility do you want me to have? And she said, you are now home videographer. And I was like, okay, what do I do? Buy a camera. I was like, okay, I'll buy a camera. So, you know, it starts out very typically. Mom tells kid to buy a camera. Kid chooses most expensive camera possible to buy. <laughs> Mom's not happy. So kid sits down with mom and dad at the dinner table. Negotiations, negotiate, negotiation. Mom's on the left, dad's on the right. I went to them, I said, hey, hey, mom and dad, you need to listen to me. I need this camera. You don't understand, I'll take very good home videos, I'll make cool science photos, they'll invite me to TED one day. This is like, oh my God. And so, uh, after a lot of back and forth, my mom still said no. But that didn't matter, because my dad said yes. And that's all that matters. So I get this camera. And, uh, and uh, there was a very specific reason why I wanted that particularly expensive camera. It was a very specific model number. And it goes back to my belief in Santa. See, when I was a kid, uh, I really, really believed in Santa. I, I went through that whole thing where you do that self-induction and think, all right, well, there are these reindeers that can fly. Santa is fat, but he can fit down a chimney. That makes sense. Everything I thought about. What I couldn't put together is how, well, I mean, you're telling me that Santa is going through all those houses eating all those cookies, drinking all that milk, and then not use the bathroom? <laughs> that's, that's just nasty, man. So I, I bring this issue up to my dad, who is a very straightforward, no joking kind of guy. And he's always got these just piles and piles of newspaper that surround him. They're like his force field. Things just bounce off of them. So I go up to him and I say, Dad, you need to level with me here. This is a profoundly difficult question. And so he, he's there, he's got his newspaper. He folds it up and he looks at me and he goes, well, maybe Santa wears an adult diaper. Have you thought about that? <laughs> Needless to say, I hadn't. So now I needed some proof. I needed a way to see in the dark. Flip back to that camera I bought. Guess what? It has night vision enabled. So <laughs> that Christmas Eve, I go up to the second floor of my house. I uh, hide my camera in a very specific spot, cover up the uh, LED that's letting you know it's recording, and I point it straight at the Christmas tree. Oh man, I was ready. This is a six-year-old kid about to find for the first time real evidence of Santa. Wake up the next morning, pull out the camera, plug it into the family computer, and I find, oh my God, this freaked me out. No Santa, no presents even, just a video of someone who looked incredibly like my mother, just suspiciously so. And the worst part yet, she forgot to buy me presents, so she was putting savings bond in the stocking. I mean, come on. And so now I need to find a way to tell my mom that I know what I know. Uh, and as you can imagine, I'm sort of going through the thoughts. I'm thinking, uh, what do I say to her? You know, I need to tell this to her quietly and sort of slyly that I sort of know. So I go up to her and uh, I, I sort of, hey mom, do you wear adult diapers? <laughs> I tell you this story today because it sort of goes into the amount of effort that it took to find a simple story. And that's what I want to talk to you about. It's this idea that a scientist and a photographer approach stories in much the same way. See, I'm a photographer, I'm an engineer, but I think as an artist, I bridge both those worlds, and that's what I'm gonna show you today. This right here is the Prince Rupert shop. When you dunk molten glass into cold water, it creates this sort of really, really cool structural tension. So here you can see the, the steel rod is being dunked in your, into your average, everyday soda lime glass. You pull it out, and you just dunk it into some cold water. Now, normally, glass is cooled in a kiln to prevent any sort of structural tension from developing. But this, we're deliberately looking for some structural tension. And so as this glass cools, you can imagine what's going on here. Basically, the outside of the glass cools faster than the inside. And when something cools, it contracts. And so the inside's trying to cool, and it's also trying to contract, but it can't do that. Why? Well, Essentially, what's happening here is the outside is already hardened. And so the inside creates an extreme state of structural tension. And there's a huge amount of stress inside this drop. So if I were to take my pocket knife and I were to hammer this bottom of this glass as hard as I can, 
I mean, you guys can hear, that's, you know, you can take some testosterone-driven kids and tell them to go ham on this and nothing's gonna happen. <laughs> on the other hand, if you just take pliers and you sort of slightly give it a smitch, what's gonna happen? Well, you think about all that structural tension inside and you think about whether or not that's gonna get released. And the answer is, the glass shatters in a spectacular way. I'll do another one so you can get a full effect of that. Basically, right here, this is where the structural tension is weakest because there is no outside uh, shell that's keeping it in. So if I just slightly snip it, it turns into powder. And all that structural tension on the inside gets released. And so I started thinking about, well, how do you demonstrate this phenomenon inside art? Well, I came to this conclusion. This right here is a Prince Rupert's drop being filmed in slow motion. So I took that freeze frame. You can see what's going on right here. The Prince Rupert's drop, I took it, cut it out, made a threshold, warped the image of the earth, took that mask of the Prince Rupert's drop I just did, and started playing with it. And I wanted to create this effect of the earth itself disintegrating. And this is what I came up with. You can see I'm going to build layers and layers and layers on top of this. And then the final result is a photo that now hangs above my bedside, reminding me about conservation and making sure that we protect the one earth we got. Um, so this took a very long time. It took a lot of burning, it took a lot of cutting myself, but the end result is something that I can hang to myself and I say, this is what art and science is all about. The other demonstration I'm going to show you right now is that you have some ferrofluid, you have a speaker, and you have, on top of that speaker, a giant magnet. So what's going on right here? Well, essentially, if you can sort of uh, imagine with me here, you have this speaker, which is a giant oscillating mechanism. You have a really, really, really strong uh, magnet on top. It's what's known as a neodymium magnet. And then the speaker is playing right now a 60 hertz sine wave, which is a very low frequency. Right now, there's a changing magnetic field constantly happening in the Petri dish. This right here is ferrofluid. Um, ferrofluid is a magnetic substance. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Um, it's magnetic substance, which means it reacts to magnetic fields. And it's also hydrophobic. So a Swiss photographer named Fabian Oefner decided to play with both these two things and came up with something that I think is really quite beautiful. All right, so there's my Petri dish, right? Here's my finger. I'm just going to spray a bit of ferrofluid on top. And you can sort of see the way that the ferrofluid is aligning itself to the magnetic field, these ridges right here. And we'll do one more. I'm going to spray some watercolor into the fluid. And you get this really cool sort of ink in motion effect that you can see on the screen right now. You can see ink itself under the, the uh, exact uh, properties of magnetism and sound. And this is what I think is the most fascinating thing about the world in which we live, because you can sort of examine these principles as a scientist or as an artist would, or you can do it as both would. And so these two experiments that I'm showing you today, they have a very specific reason, and that is that most of the time when you look at these photos and you can sort of see the end result that happened, the picture is what everyone sees. And that makes sense, right? Whether it is a photograph or it's an engineering project, um, the end result is what everybody celebrates. And obviously, that simply makes sense because that's the part that people can see. But what people seldomly don't understand is the difficulty and the, structure, the, the struggle that goes along with making images like this. There is this Greek phrase, kalipa takala, which means that beauty is harsh. Translation, things are not beautiful without difficulty. When I create images like this, I think a lot about that difficulty. That difficulty for me is at a genetic level. I am colorblind. I have something called deuteranopia red-green colorblindness. And so when you see all these images, you can think about, yay, I'm, looking, I'm working with all these uh, cool substances, and I'm working and working and working. You can think about all of that struggle because I, most of the time, can't tell what exactly it is that I'm working with. If you want to simulate what I see, I took a photo that I took of New York City a while back, and I split it down the middle. Right here on the left is a simulation of what I see, and on the right is what everyone else sees. Now, for me, I see the same thing on both sides because I'm colorblind. But my roommate tells me that they're very different, and I can't, as a scientist, objectively verify what he is saying unless I look at the histograms in Photoshop. Here's another one of me walking down. And so this is a problem. This is a serious, serious problem. For me, what it means is that photography isn't just a hobby. In a very real sense, it is a struggle. 
my roommate and my friends will all tell you about the amount of times I'm working on a photo, and I'll have to ask them, you know, hey, does this, does this photo look right? How do the skin tones look? And the responses will range from, yeah, looks good, to, uh, dude, you look like Donald Trump without a spray tan. <laughs> and you never want to look like a Donald Trump in any way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so whether or not we realize it, photographers and engineers spend a lot of time just getting the little things like color accuracy right. The thing that I think is most interesting is that the missing the smallest moment in a photo or getting the smallest software bug will throw your entire project off. But that's where the fun is at. You see, I live with the reality that every day, people see colors I simply can't perceive. And somehow, I'm totally at peace with that. Studying science and making photos, I figured I could learn how to see. A powerful lesson for someone who can't change so much of what he is seeing. Perspective, that unique individual abstraction that comprises so much of what it means to be human. For me, Science is my way of engineering my own perspective. It's my way of refining aesthetics, of manipulating light, of, in a very real sense, creating for myself vision. It's my way of solving this genetic issue. And so now it's something that I celebrate. It's something that I think about whether or not the colors look right, if the resistor values that I'm reading are color-coded correctly, because I simply can't tell. And I think the point at which I'm trying to get at right now is that a perspective can be engineered. It can be developed. I found mine at the center line of two very different fields, but it somehow all comes together to demonstrate the projects that I've shown you today. When I think back to what my mom there first told me, that everyone needs a responsibility. Well, mine consists of inaccurate color readings. It consists of formulas and theories that are floating around in my head, but most importantly, it consists of a need and a desire to create something beautiful with both sides of me. Science is my way of seeing what I normally can't see. It's my way of emotional engineering. Thank you all very much.